Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much for checking out the series. As always, uh, we put out three new interviews every single week, a brand new one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if you, you like what you're catching today, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Uh, I'm so excited to be talking with two amazing songwriters, Stone Gossard and Mason Jennings. They have a, uh, they have, they have a band together these days called Painted Chill. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us. No, it's great to see you both. So I, I was I was trying to work it out in my head if I wanted to say new band, because while the debut record is on the way, this isn't exactly actually new, right? This this does stretch back a, a few years. Um, how did this start? Either one of you want to take that. Mason, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's been about six years. Uh, we had a mutual friend, Dan Field, who introduced us and you know, we're both interested in, in collaborating. Stone had some recordings that he was maybe looking to have somebody sing on. And I was, you know, had done so much solo stuff. And I was like, I'd like to work with someone and try some collaborative recordings. So that's when it started. And it just sort of blossomed over the last six years. Yeah. But six years, I mean, to, to do a couple songs. And then as I read, I think, you know, one day in the studio together at all, uh, you know, since, since then. Stone, is that an odd way to collaborate? Uh, well, I've never done it. I've never done it like this before. So it's, it's different. And uh, it, it was, a, I don't think we, either of us saw uh, the big picture um, six years ago, but we saw the small picture was, you know, the small picture was we did knife fight and it sounded great. And we were like, wow, that was instantaneous. And like, um, I, I just had this, uh, this demo that I had recorded with Josh Freeze on drums and, and um, me playing some bass. And it was, pretty quick and down and dirty and he just threw a vocal on it and it was like we were off and running so it was a very uh uh i was very optimistic about the beginning and then we did some more songs and it was more like regular like okay we got to actually kind of figure these songs out and it yeah. wasn't instantaneous um sort of like knife fight so we, we we did some stuff and we really were we kind of moved a lot in that first year and tried a lot of stuff and then maybe we took a couple of years where we were sort of like I don't even know how much we talked over at least a year or two of it. And then we started, you know, as you do, you go back in time. That's what we do is like, Oh, I wonder if that, that, that was fun. I, I want to check it out again. And so we just started communicating more again and started, you know, just chipping away at some more songs. And then I think really in the last year and a half, it, it, we finally got over the hump with about three or four more really kind of instantaneous kind of tracks um that just came really easy and then um the addition of matt chamberlain and britney davis in the last year and a half like sort of really sort of elevated it and um matt chamberlain started writing some songs for it and um and britney davis's voice um and keyboard playing just really sort of added another whole nother dimension to the to the music so then it started to sound more like a band you know because um to start out with it was a lot of me and mason which is fun and exciting but it's it's good when it's, you know, if you're going to try to do something different, you need that, um, you need the influence of other perspectives. So it, it really worked out. And point out, you said Matt Chamberlain, that's uh, also, aside from being one of the greatest drummers of all time, known for being probably the shortest Pearl Jam drummer for all of what, <laughs> uh, half a day or something like that. <laughs> it was a bad era we were uh we we loved matt chamberlain and but he was off and running and had many more stars to play with so uh, which worked out great all around but he's he's played with everybody and um you know him playing with bob dylan is kind of the apex now where he's like making records with bob dylan <clears throat> he gets to talk to bob dylan on the phone sometimes that's that's i don't know how Nobody gets to talk to Bob Dylan. He's not in it. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. Mason, you know, we, we've all been big fans of yours at WFPK for a long time. Um, I, I can say that, uh, you know, Be Here Now and Raindrops on the Kitchen Floor. I mean, for me and my wife, those are two very important songs. Oh, and I, I think I have the uh, Always Been record here behind me. You know, this is a... But for you, this is, I mean, from what I understand, like this has been very different from you, you know, coming from really being a solo artist to being a collaborator. How has it changed how you've had to approach a song, if it has at all? Uh, it's been pretty different. You know, it's, it's definitely like I'm used to having an instrument in my hands when I'm, when I'm working on vocals or, you know, like being able to control the chordal, chordal direction or rhythm. And at first it was definitely very 
very new. But then, you know, over those six years, I think that's part of why it took six years. Is I was getting better at it. You know, I was getting more comfortable, like just figuring out what my role is with that. And, and it's, and it's a different kind of role. It's like, you have to kind of like let go of some stuff that I'm used to being able to control. Like, and that was, that's something that's, it's a good lesson to learn, I think, you know, because then people, what I'm learning is other people are going to step up. Like at first when I was doing it, I didn't know what other people were going to be bringing there. Cause I was used to handling everything. It's like when you're used to, you know, cooking all the meals and then suddenly you have somebody doing different parts of it and it's, it can go so much better and you can, you can just come up with stuff that you, I just couldn't have done all by myself at all. So um, it's been a learning process to like, to like, w- what is my role? what can I work really hard on? Cause I want to work really hard, but what, where do I have to let go and let other people do their stuff too. And, and, you know, especially with like when Matt Chamberlain got involved too, like um, he's holding a huge, he, he's, you know, like a song, like um, uh, I am your country. Like that's mostly Matt Chamberlain's track, like musically and then stone. And I just kind of like sit in on top of that. And that's so cool to get him involved. And then Brittany Davis too, you know, I'm used to singing all my own harmonies. I'm used to singing like um, you know, like, she's singing all of those parts that, that I would usually have to cover. And she's, she's doing it better than me. So it's like, I'm like, Oh God, this is so cool to hear it back because I, you know, her range is bigger, her, you know, she's a better singer. Let's just come, let's just say that. (laughs) And so, you know, it's really cool to have it just elevate like that. An orphan no longer, no pun intended with the album titles there, but uh, look, you you have a family. I have a family. (laughs) family. It's, um, it's, it's nearly an operatic record. I think that's what surprised me. Uh, the most is when all those ingredients does do come together. Uh, it becomes like there are movements going on uh, all throughout this record. Even, you know, the, some of the songs really line up with the other one kind of bleed into each other. Do you all talk specifically about, specifically about wanting to go someplace musically? Hey, we don't talk. We're not, we don't, we don't break it down too much in terms of sort of why we're excited. Mostly we're like, that excites me or that that's thrilling or whatever that is, is, you know, it's, it's hitting me in the right way. I think a lot of the sort of uh, the dynamics and sort of maybe, I mean, I haven't heard it described as operatic and that's exciting to think that that's, it has an element of that in it. But I think some of that might be John Conglinton too, who's the mixer. Mm -hmm. And um, again, staying in, we were so rewarded by sort of opening the door for Matt and Brittany to kind of really uh, play a bigger role than, than some people sort you know, some people aren't looking to have more opinions in, in a record or more sort of uh, directions. And, and I think that that's where we sort of pushed ourselves is to kind of go, this is going to only improve if we, if we open our, you know, if we share it more and sort of really, trust that something good can happen by having somebody else touch it. And I think we carried that into, you know, when we found out that John liked the music and was interested in mixing it. And then we found out that, you know, because of COVID that all of a sudden his schedule (laughs) changed dramatically. um, We were, you know, we basically said to him, you know, think of yourself as a member of the band and, you know, go into it with the attitude of I'm hearing these songs for the first time. And what would I do? You know what? Because I know he's a player, and he's mixed everything, and his ear is so, you know, he has a unique perspective that is going to be totally, you know, different than than Mason's and I's. So uh, we just really turned it over to him, and he really pulled a lot of stuff out, made sections much more defined, took parts that we thought were the main parts and turned them off and turned up a little part that was recorded way at the beginning that was just a scratch track that all of a sudden becomes the new part so that's and then even hearing it back I think the first time was like whoa is this really our record now and then you give it a week and then all of a sudden it's like oh my god thank you thank you for doing that (laughs) you just get so trapped in your own way of seeing your art when you're doing it that it takes a second to digest uh, significant shifts in, in how somebody else could hear it. And so that, that really was, I mean, we pat ourselves on the back about that all the time in terms of like, wow, the best thing, you know, one of the best things we did was like think John Congleton would be great to mix it and we should let him do whatever he wants. So, um, and it, and it really worked out, but I think some of that, the big dynamics are due to him. You know, he really, he really pruned uh, and, and, and simplified um, some things, but also created 
sort of more three-dimensionalness to the whole record in terms of just his how he puts stuff in space and mm -hmm. um it's 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 pretty great to watch uh, to listen to his um his work yeah i think it, uh, me, I probably like a lot of people first came aware of him because of uh, his work with St. Vincent and he's just become yeah. one of the most dynamic, you know, producers out there doing a lot of stuff. And, and, you know, you talked about being kind of close to your own music and not kind of hearing it the same way. And I, I purposefully put your solo record back here, Stone, with Bayleaf because there are parts on here that really reminded me of what you were doing on Bayleaf for the first time and maybe since yeah. then. And, and, did you, because I know, you know, from what I read anyway, a lot of these uh, uh, guitar parts, musical snippets or whatever do come from as, or, you know, far back as 10, 15 years ago. Did you find that you were leaning towards a certain style of yours, towards certain sounding songs to put in this project? I'm a, I'm a pack rat. So I just, I just, you know, I write songs and then I make demos and I try to do them as kind of quickly. I, I, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of like, time. I wish I had weeks and months to go in the studio and hang out. Um, and I, but I don't know that that would actually be better for me. So when I do demos, I do them pretty down and dirty and pretty quick. And I just try to get the, the, the idea down. And so I end up with, you know, I've got hundreds of, you know, incomplete, you know, sketches and, um, and, and really I was pretty, uh, um, irreverent with just kind of listening you know going through those sketches sometimes and just sending a few to mason every once in a while and and he would either get excited about them or you know or wouldn't but um that was kind of the process is just you know a little bit of just kind of point and shoot and just go i don't know this never really got i never really got anything on it or i never got any farther with it but i always you know and particularly if you recorded something 10 years ago and then you listen to it quickly again um just in passing you can really hear whether you still like it or not you know it's like oh i still like that that's you know that's good so that that's a good test in terms of like something that you can remember doing and 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 if it doesn't move you 10 years later it's maybe not that great you know it wasn't that great to start out with so but it's 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 a little bit it's a little bit scattershot the process it's not it's not too cerebral yeah, well, there's some cool, I mean, there's so many cool moments on this record. Uh, first, I'll bring up uh, Time Machine, which has this incredible groove and those horns that come out of nowhere. I mean, I almost, I think I actually ye yelled yes when that all started happening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, Mason, I, I would like to hear about your lyrical approach on this song and a couple others too, because, uh, I, if, well, first off, I, I want to ask the broad question. It's sort of in the same way with Stone. Uh, did you find yourself going in a certain direction once you all really did get started here uh, lyrically? Not consciously. I mean, originally it was just the same, same thing Stone said. I was just trying. I was just like throwing stuff at it and be like, wow, that worked or that didn't work. And it was just it was really like cool to have it be a side project because I didn't feel the pressure that like I had to be like, this is, this is my solo record. I was just like, well, does this work? Does this work? Does this work? And then slowly over like years, I was like, what, what really ended up happening lyrically is that the stuff that really stuck for whatever reason was this, a lot of these themes of like unconscious stuff from the past getting worked through and brought into the present moment and then looking forward into the future. So it's like, that just sort of kind of became, which is cool because this process has been kind of that it's like unconscious, something that took six years and, slowly got more consciousness on it and then we're moving into the future and so that's that's kind of lyrically what stuck the most when i look back at the theme i'm like there kind of is a theme there it's just i didn't there was also a lot of weird stuff that got trimmed off that what had nothing to do with that too so <laughs> well, I, I hear that time thing especially in the uh, in the 10 years song the, the i mean the concept of trying to project yourself forward so you can look back uh, is completely fascinating in that sense you know how you kind of manipulate time in that way with your own head which um, yeah yeah. And that's what, that's what Time Machine, the song was about too, which is funny because 10 years from now is that, but then Time Machine, that song originally had a totally different chorus that was really melodic. And, um, you know, the, the beginning was the same, but then there was originally other lyrics. And then it slowly, I was just like this idea of time machines, but it, it wasn't like there's no time machine. It was like, I wish I had a time machine or something like that. I wish we had time machines and we could fly around. And then it was just getting all flowery. And then Stone was like, oh, I got an idea. Took the whole chorus off, sent me back this really cool, like just way more guttural blues based thing and then i just sang my mama says there's no time machines like i just like first take boom sang it and sent it back and we're like okay now we're talking like we got out of our heads got into our muscles and and that's what happened there 
Well, I might be stretching a little bit here, but you know, with a lot of artists that I've been talking to, there is a lot of uh, escapism for obvious reasons uh, for the past few years. Um, and, and, you know, for some artists who have been talking about, you know, sort of pale blue dot style going to space to get away from things, you know, the other side seems to be talking about this manipulating time in a way, um, although I might not say as, as interesting as, as you've been able to pull off here. I feel like that might, if that's, if that's even on the right path, that sort of wraps around into what becomes, you know, the lead single, I guess, with I Am Your Country on this too, because here's another interesting thing. Where did this concept come from? Because this is a song about personifying the actual country speaking to us, correct? Yeah, but it, it originally was, it came from a lyric that was about uh, a father speaking to kids, you know, because I went through a divorce a few years ago that was really rough and, and had some parental alienation I was dealing with. So it was, I was sort of like talking to kids and then it was just way too personal. And then with the stuff, I live in Minneapolis and when George Floyd was murdered, like it just all of a sudden I was listening to this track by Matt Chamberlain. And I just like track without any vocals. I just listened to it for fun. And I just started singing a variation on that lyric. And I was like, I changed it to, I started singing it from the point of view as my, of I'm your country. And then the rest of it sort of shifted and became like more abstract and, and it just hit, just felt good for me to sing it. And I was just sort of doing it for myself. And then I sent it to Stone. I thought the record was finished at this point. So I was like, hey, check out this. And he was like, oh, dude, that's, that's going to be the first, that's going to be the first single. I was like, what the, I was just doing it for my own personal, you know, artistic expression at that point. Yeah. New songs, best song. That's always the game, right? <laughs> New songs, best song. Blows, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I think it, I think it is the most, it's the most visceral, immediate, thing on the record and it and it and it really is the first opportunity of of mason and matt collaborating in a sense and it's the, the matt's tracks that he's writing right now are so spacious and so like drum aggressive in like this kind of john bonham like not a drum machine at all sort of way but in a like i'm a powerhouse drummer and if you saw me playing in a room your jaw would drop because i'm slaying my you know my <laughs> instrument um and so you know for me that between that lyric and that groove and the space and that track i was just like i was convinced that it was you know it's our best song you know yeah. it just really struck me that way do you all find that this song yeah, in a way that yeah do you all find that this song in a way that songs do uh, allow themselves to change um with the world you know here's a song that was written obviously with trump as president and now there is a possibility of a future once again. I mean, do you find that this song starts to speak in a different way? Yeah, probably. I mean, it does feel good. I haven't, I haven't heard it since, since this last week, so I should listen to it again. I think it would probably hit me different, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love that about songs, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, like sometime I'll write a song 10 years and then it comes up and somebody will be like, this song is about this, it's happening right now, isn't it? And I'll listen, I'll be like, yeah, it is. I don't know how that happens, but sometimes yeah. it's, it's so cool and trippy. Yeah, I do love that. Um, there's so many great moments in here. Uh, I mean, this seriously is, I was so blown away by this whole record. So I want to, I don't think I properly wow. complimented you all that's on this. That's so nice. That's yeah. so, thank you so much. That's really, that's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. It plays great loud and probably plays great soft. I just haven't tried it like that yet. Um, I, I would do want to hit a few things outside exactly of the record. And first off, uh, it's, this record also, as the press release will tell you, marks the return of Loose Groove Records, uh, Stone. Uh, this is you started with uh, with Reagan, Reagan Hagar, right? Um, yeah, Reagan. Reagan, Reagan. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, I think I had, that was the other thing. That's one of my all-time favorite Loose Groove things right here with the Chicago Cab. What is that? That's the Chicago Cab oh, Chicago, soundtrack. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. So, so amazing awesome. stuff on there. Yeah. What does this mean for the label? I mean, is this really a full-on thing again? I mean, do you guys have bigger plans than just than just this uh, painted shield record yeah we're uh we're we're uh you know regan and i have been friends for 30 years regan was the drummer in malfunction so i was seeing regan's band play before i even started playing an instrument basically um or or very close to it um you know back when i was in green river and just like just starting to even like think about wanting to play music he was in Malfunction and they were doing Discharge, Speed Metal, and then Halftime, crazy, you know, Kiss tributes. And uh, that's the start of it for me in terms of seeing young musicians 
that are that were amateurs, but also totally adventurous and playing live shows and succeeding in just totally charming and exhilarating a bar with 20 people in it. And, and at the time or a, or a club or whatever. And, you know, at the, at the time it was, it foundationally changed me in terms of like thinking about heavy metal and punk rock and disco and all, how all those things mean a lot to me. And yet at that time, particularly it sort of wasn't, you weren't, it wasn't, you know, that wasn't what you did in eighth grade in 1978, you either, you know, you liked disco or you, you liked rock, you know, or, you know, that was my perception. You know, I'm sure there's people that were smarter than me, but um, so, you know, going back to Regan and then our years in Brad and all of that, um, we did lose groove. We had some success with it. Um, not financially, but we, 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 we achieved a lot. And then, um, you know, with the opportunities, you know, with this record being done, um, and, and with some other records that, that I've been kind of, um, helping shepherd in, in Seattle, I knew that there was an opportunity and, um, because the orchard was, uh, uh, interested in painted shield and also interested in loose groove. We connect, made a good connection there and, and have a great, uh, person at the orchard who's now part of our loose groove, uh, world. And, um, we're just going to keep putting records out. Hopefully, uh, hopefully another painted shield if they'll sign with loose groove. Um, that'll be good uh, to see how that works out. I don't know. They may go on to bigger and better things. Who knows though? They might, they might leave me. I mean, no, they won't, they can't. Um, uh, but, uh, Brittany Davis, we're going to, um, put her record out. So she's making a solo record right now. So that'll be really, that's a really exciting thing to kind of hear her, um, uh, uh, there's also one record that I'm the most excited about right now, which is the, the living, um, which is, um, Duff McKagan and Greg Gilmore, Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses, who was in all my favorite punk bands back in the day. And, uh, Greg Gilmore, who was a drummer in, um, Mother Love Bone. Um, they have a record called 1982. They made in 1982. That's never come out before. And it's all Duff McKagan original, you know, amazing hardcore, you know, punk rock slash proto grunge songs that was never released. And I mean, the fact that we are able to kind of put it out and um, and that it hasn't ever come out before and that Duff's excited about uh, talking about it and uh, and Greg, um, it's really an amazing record. And and it really shows how central Duff was to uh, what happened in Seattle. Um, although he doesn't get talked about, you know, he went on to guns and roses. So that kind of takes over sure. the narrative so much, but he was the guy. And, and clearly this record proves that in terms of, uh, when you hear it now and you kind of go, wow, I hear elements of Tim and a warning. And I hear elements of the farts and I hear elements of, of, uh, guns and roses, um, and all these influential, you know, bands. Um, it's cool. So lots of, lots of stuff going on there. Yeah, I had Duff on the show earlier than the, was this year, last year, or something like that. His new solo record is oh, yeah. fantastic too. Uh, and and that, yeah. I've heard that there is there is one more Brad record. I mean, losing Sean, you yeah. know, I, I don't think any of us knew that. That what what can we expect from uh, from the next Brad record? Because I I've got them all. I, you know, what a band. Yeah, oh, that's that's great. Um, well, you know, Sean's there's a lot of Sean solo stuff for sure that um, is going to eventually come out and. And uh, there is a Brad record and we're sort of in the process now of, of, of kind of finalizing mixes and, and making sure that it's um, as good as it can be. But we haven't we haven't quite got to the finish line yet there. But, you know, there's for sure 10 songs. It's just a, it's a matter of of now uh, figuring out how far to to sort of massage those tracks to kind of um, to make them as good as they can be. And I you know, that that's going to not be the easiest it's not the easiest journey to figure that out, but uh, some beautiful Sean Smith vocals that people haven't heard yet. So um, I look forward to that as well. What an amazing, amazing vocalist. I mean, I've got interiors yeah. behind me, but you know, the day brings just, we still yeah, yeah. spin that on FPK. It's one of our all time favorites. Um, just incredible. That's nice, Mason, um, last album was 2018. That's probably the usual amount of time for most uh, <laughs> most artists, unless you're talking about Pearl Jam, of course, they'll make you wait a little bit longer, but yeah. Uh, yeah. you got more in the works for yourself? 
yeah i've got a, i've got about six new songs i'm working on so six or seven so yeah i'm hoping to hopefully start recording sometime in the next year and and hopefully maybe you know maybe it'll be loose groove that would be awesome put it put something yeah on it. So, yeah definitely I'm, get I'm that definitely contract like, signed now that's uh <laughs> yeah do it on, on zoom <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. And it's been cool. I mean, there's been so much, we're working on a bunch of stuff for Painted Shield too. So it's, you know, like, it's cool to have both things going at the same time like that. Yeah. Uh, I'll wrap up. Of course, still, I hope you'll permit me with one or two Pearl Jam questions here because uh, Gigaton did come out. You've not been able to tour that obviously as no one has. Does that give you a different relationship with an album when, you know, in this, that you haven't been able to touch it in the same way that you would have otherwise? Um, it's, it's just such a weird time. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what the, uh, I don't know what's weird, um, in terms of the big picture. It's, it's weird to not have, you know, to have gotten, we rehearsed up till like right before we left. So we were kind of like hitting, like we were like, we are ready to go. We were, the songs were sounding good. And, um, it was going to be a, it was going to be a great tour. And, um, since then, um, you know, I barely picked up my guitar, so I'm going to have to, it's the it's the longest time without playing Pearl Jam songs, which is weird because we've got so many and I sort of I'm able to kind of keep them all just kind of in my head in terms of being able to remember where my fingers are. And I, I'm I'm terrified that we've gone so long now that I'm actually going to be looking at a set list kind of going. I've had dreams about it already where I'm like, you know, the band is just about to start and I'm struggling to get out onto stage and then. I can see the set list and I know that I haven't practiced them and I'm about to go out there and just, <laughs> just not know anything. But uh, it's it's just a weird, we're just in a weird time and a weird year and uh, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of it, but I'm proud of the record. And, you know, uh, I, I really think it was a, um, a victory uh, and um, I'm, 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 I'm so happy to be in the band and it, it's so much of this stuff and and how how i'm able to generate and and try different things is due to sort of the creativity and the and the journey that i've taken with those guys over the last 30 years so um it, a lot of it a lot of this uh, emanates from my relationship with that band and and how we've treated each other and and how we've kind of moved through different eras of you know, you, you know, you can spend a lot of time, you, you can have eras where you're like, oh, this is not that great, or I don't want to do this. And then you look back and kind of go, why was I just, be, why wasn't I just looking at the, what I could do as opposed to like what wasn't working? And and I think that that's the, the lesson learned at this point. Yeah. Well, you said 30 years. I mean, this year marks 30 years for you. I think it was October, if I remember right, or, or in November. But uh, yeah. But I don't know if you guys would have been celebrating in a big way if there, you know, had been any plans like that. I, I, I'll tell you, as a fan, I've, per, I, I've, I've really personally been hoping for more of those box sets, like you did with Ten Verses and Vitology. Yeah. Do you ever yeah. think that the the at least the no code and yield is going to come? Do you ever? I mean, do you all ever have plans to follow oh, I, those I'm up? Sure, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. I, I think at this point we're just we're slowing down because we're old, and uh, and we know we've got plenty of time, and that there's plenty of time for you know for looking back so um i think that there's a everyone's kind of in a pause right now everyone's just trying to keep their home lives together given the circumstances of what's happening right now and how much uh how much everything is telling you just to pay attention to your you know the closest things in front of you um but it, there'll, there'll be opportunities for that i'm sure i'm i'm sure that those will come out as will more sort of live shows and stuff like that um but i'm i'm honestly i'm looking forward to you know, recording more music. I, I think Gigaton touched on some really cool new territory and, and sort of there was some doors open there that I, I hope we keep walking through. I mean, musically, I, I love seeing where you guys go lyrically, of course, you're, you know, um, yeah. especially with, you know, talking about Greta and everything and, and the environment. I mean, again, I'll, I'll say what you know, we were talking about earlier that now we have a hope for the future once again. A hope that yeah. I don't think a lot of us have felt for a long time. A hope that I feel like you all have captured in this Painted Shield record. So, you know, if there's more oh. of that to mine, I, I certainly would love to hear it. Yeah, that's Thank very nice. I'm glad there's some optimism in there. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Well, Mason Stone, thank you both so much for taking the time to talk about it again. Uh, this Painted Shield record it's huge. Uh, everyone should listen to it. Everybody should buy it. I hope you guys end up pushing this to radio. We're going to be playing it at FPK regardless. I think uh, Level is going to awesome. be our track that we're going to be hitting so really hard. So, Oh, great. 
Yeah. So, um, Great. and, um, and, awesome. and to many more painted shield records in the future as well. So thank you good. so much for your yeah, time. Really you. appreciate it. All right. Thank you both. Take care. Have a good one. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.